name's Michael Pate. I'm a partner at Killing Co. I'm joined by Paul Kavanagh, Chief Investment Officer and partner. Uh, we're here to talk about our prediction for 2014. Uh, before we do that, let's just square off on 2013. Um, by and large, they're a good set of predictions. Um, our year-end target for, for the FTSE 100 was 6,500. Uh, we're currently around 25 points off that. Our attractive sector for the year uh, was small cap equities, uh, with the FTSE small cap up 26% year to date. That's been a strong area. Um, our one for the brave was uh, Jap Japan equ equities. Um, that's been very strong this year, up 46% year to date. Um, we also uh, were predicting the next bubble would be Japanese government bonds. They've actually been quite resilient, um, uh, so, so that didn't pop as expected. And then finally, um, we were advising clients not to be short soft commodities. They've actually had quite a poor year. Um, all commodities um, have performed relatively poorly uh, against equity markets. Um, and some of that weakness has leaked into our 10 for 2013 uh, with provenant resources um, before underperforming the market as well as Glencore. Um, to the positive, there's plenty, plenty to be positive in the, in the top 10. Uh, Boeing was up 75% on the year, uh, Nike was up 48%, and Vodafone was up 48%. Um, so 2013, by and large, was a year where the uh, equity market re-rated as risk aversion subsided. Paul, 2014, can we be optimistic about the equity market? We certainly think so. Um, we've got a forecast for um, next year of 7,400, um, so from 6,500, that seems quite a quite a big leap. Um, the, really, the two major major issues that I think come around for next year at the macro level are the US. They're going to start tapering, normalising rates. That would be their objective. What impact would that have on the US economy? Can it ride through that relatively unscathed, or will there be problems along the way? And in Europe, of course, as we're seeing inflation begin to, to um, continue to decline, um, there is a feeling or of a need for a second stimulus programme along the lines of the LTRO programme. We've certainly seen, just in the course of the last few days, noises coming about, particularly with the banking sector in Europe, about potentially some, some additional measures that the central banks may take to try and provoke more stimulation in the economy and get away from this sort of hoarding of liquidity that's taking place within banks at the moment. But whatever does come out, the prime objective is about increasing the transmission of money through the system and really trying to get stronger growth through, through Europe. Now, with that backdrop in mind, we think it, it remains a sort of relatively um, uh, good situation for, for businesses in the way that they can stabilise their top line, control their bottom line, increase their cash flow. They've already got strong corporate balance sheets. So we still see the corporate sector being the sort of relative safe haven in all of this, if you compare and contrast it to, say, governments or consumers at the moment. And really, where would 7,400 put us in the FTSE 100? Um, well, with a dividend yield of around 3.8% net, that's making assumptions on the dividend growth we expect to see next year, and a price earnings multiple of around 13 to 14 times, putting it in the sort of long-term median range of, of forecasts, then we don't think that's stretching valuations, and, um, and that's where we come up with our 7,400 number for this year. And that 20-year chart that I posted here at the moment would, would demonstrate that finally we would be sort of breaking out of that sort of 10-year cycle of wondering whether we would push through 7,000. Right, great. So um, we're positive on UK equities. Um, for those uh, clients that can accept a little bit more volatility, where would you go to maximise opportunities in markets? Well, you commented for 2013, we picked out uh, the UK small cap sector as still being um, the, uh, our asset of choice, and we're keeping it for a second year running. Um, it did outperform the FTSE for 2013. We think it's certainly capable of doing so for 2014. As we exit this year, we are seeing now much more interest coming back into, into the sector. Fund managers are definitely looking for more idea flow at the moment. They're a little bit bored, to be honest, with trading large cap stocks. They're looking for more alpha in their portfolio, so they're coming up the risk scale to find, find more value. We're seeing more new issues. We're certainly seeing, at the moment, secondary placings. So there's a lot of capital coming into the sector. And don't forget, of course, ISA, there were the rule changes back at the end of um, 2013, or August 2013, meant that ISAs were now open up to AIM stocks, um, has potentially 
potentially opened up um, a, tr a tremendous amount of new capital for the sector. So we think there's enough momentum behind the sector to, to allow this to be the outperforming um, asset class of choice. Great, great. Probably one of the biggest surprises of, of, of this year has been the effect of rising US bond yields on the emerging markets. Um, what markets do we think are interesting for 2014? I've published the chart here of the, the China Shanghai Index. Um, it's down um, on, over the course of the year. Um, it's been the material underperformer. Um, and that's been right. I, I think that um, over, over this time there is a transition that has taken place, a lot of, a lot of um, uncertainty around growth rates and how they can manage this transition during this political, um, politically uncertain period for, for China. Um, but as we exit, um, I think we've avoided the hard landing that was much forecast earlier in this year. They're moving the economy away from what I refer to as infrastructure build, um, uh, spend, building these sort of ghost cities um, that, that have been sort of largely the worries about the bubbles that have been created and moving it much more towards a domestic demand growth economy. And the uh, announcement of the third plenum, I think, is just additional signs of the measures that are being put in place um, to, to really develop that, um, the, the trends happening there at the moment. So, um, so we think that uh, last year Japan was our one for the brave, this year it's going to be China. If you want to play China, um, well there are certain ways of, ways of playing China. Um, first eight Asia China growth is Mick Gilligan's recommendation, our head of research on, on, uh, on the fund side. Um, but we also have quite large Chinese businesses that are quoted either in Hong Kong or increasingly in New York now. Um, and I suspect during 2014 we may see one or two heading here towards London as well. So there are going to be increasing ways of playing China without feeling that you have to go directly to the, um, to the Chinese stock market. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so given that we're positive on GDP for next year, um, if you're looking to increase the economic sensitivity of a portfolio, where would you go and, and what's going to affect those sort of valuations? Well, we, we, still, we still like Japan, even though Japan was, was one for the brave last year. Um, that 46% move that you mentioned on the Nikkei has certainly proved to be um, a, a good trade-off for the risk that was taken at that time. What hasn't happened in Japan yet, um, however, is, has been a big re-rating in the stock market relative to earnings. What has happened is, of course, their, their main focus has been about depreciating the yen. They've really led the charge in what we call this race to the bottom for currencies and trying to drive export-led um, uh, demand uh, out, of, out of Japan. Um, this has manifested itself in a 20% depreciation in, in the yen, and uh, it's meant that uh, those big international export uh, country, companies um, have been able to fairly materially move their earnings um, up um, through the cycle this year. And that's what's driven the market. It's not been about a, an expansion in the price earnings ratio, which is really why the US market's moved. You're just paying higher prices for the profits that they're able to deliver. This has felt just a little bit more solid foundation with, with the earnings moving higher. So it moves out of the camp of what I think is one for the brave. I think it's a trend that is now very much underway. You know, some of the big hedge funds there at the moment are sort of very short the yen, long equities at the moment. But um, we, we actually see scope for this to, to sort of move ahead um, uh, over the course of 2014. So we, we, we fully accept that it's a, it's a big risk that, um, that the central banks are taking here to stimulate demand. But the early anecdotal signs are positive. We'll just keep an eye on those JGBs you mentioned last year um, about the fact that uh, they didn't pop, they didn't get out of control. We will keep a close eye on those because if there aren't signs that their strategy is just taking on too much risk for the bond markets, then of course we'll have to fairly quickly reverse our decisions on equities. Okay. And those more cyclical international stocks? Yes, in terms of um, in terms of the, um, uh, the, the our funds, Morant Japan Fund is the uh, is is our selection for the research um, for the research uh, guys who are looking at the funds of playing. They think that's the the best way of playing the Japan market at the moment. If you're not looking for direct equities, turning to some of the economically sensitive stocks here in London, um, you know one of the advantages we have in London are some good ways of playing a lot of the growth that is happening. If you're looking at China, for example. Intercontinental hotels 10 years ago owned a lot of hotels and, um, and that became a very capital intensive type of business. But the strategy of really exiting from ownership of, of hotels 
over that period and really just moving into the management side of hotels. So hotel owners coming to them and saying, look, we want to put the intercontinental name onto, um, onto our hotel and have you manage it for us has meant that the business now remains quite operationally geared to the upside. In the US, where it's a dominant player, they're seeing higher occupancy rates and they're seeing some small firming in pricing. Um, London has proved to be uh, a strong market during the course of 2013. In the regions it's been slower, and uh, as has been the case in Europe. But the real driver here is that China remains sort of fairly, fairly uh, underinvested in hotel capacity. There's certainly huge amounts of travel that's taking place as that economy continues to build out at the moment. And Intercontinental Hotels is a, is a sort of great play on that, um, on that exposure. So we certainly put that into, um, into that uh, list. Um, likewise, in the car industry, again, another industry that 10 years ago you would not think about buying for cyclical upturns or uh, almost structural upturns. Um, but Volkswagen has made a big pitch into the emerging economies and also into um, China. Um, this is, a, this is a, a company that has a number of brands right across the spectrum of the car market and sells into 153 countries around the world. In terms of its pricing, it probably is about a 20% discount to the BMWs and Mercedes of this world, but we think operational efficiencies that have been built out by putting these sort of brands together um, has meant that this is a company that has some real momentum behind it and doesn't look um, uh, expensive for us. So you mentioned structural. Um, what, what, what key structural growth stories are we going to be looking at for 2014 and how, how do we play that in stocks? Well, um, one of the major themes that we have been picking on through 2013 and see no reason to sort of um, um, uh, take off the list is, is the growth in airline travel. Um, again, I, I keep referring to the fact that we've got different, a different world here, a building here. Um, ten years ago, it was very much felt that air travel was a maturing business with airport capacity in the Western world sort of running pretty much at 90% plus. But as new air, airport capacity is being built globally around the stream, just look at the way that Dubai is now sort of possibly a year, 18 months away from taking over Heathrow. Um, and as you've moved further east, the growth in international travel at the moment is really um, actually um, making sort of good headway for companies such as Boeing, which was on our list, and as you saw, was up um, very strongly last year. We're picking on Rolls-Royce. Uh, obviously, Rolls-Royce is a good service provider um, into, the, um, into the airline sector. Its Trent engines are obviously uh, uh, are in, in demand for, for, this, um, for, for this growth. And of course, they pick up that very lucrative maintenance um, stream that comes off the back of these airline engines um, over the course of 10, 20 years. And that is the high margin business. It's had a good year. It's not been unrecognized by the markets, but we see that uh, uh, trend um, continuing quite strongly. Um, same with Amazon. Um, the Amazon uh, business, has, uh, as we all know, has, has made huge inroads into very structural areas of the market like retail um, and cause some damage. Um, they are um, very, very cheap, as we know, to, um, to buy goods off and very convenient. So that's posing lots of um, issues to traditional retailers who don't have their e-commerce strategies sort of well up to, well up to scratch. Um, but um, that retail story has got a long way to run as they take market share off of those, and that's what's been driving the market. But in order to do so, they, they have to invest huge amounts into the computing power and cloud computing power that, um, that uh, they have so far. And uh, we're particularly excited about the development in terms of renting that. So for businesses that are looking at their IT strategy and are looking to, um, to, to sort of um, make sure that they revolutionise their IT strategy in, in line with, um, with, with best, in best practice at the moment, then actually you do need to look to cloud computing. And actually Amazon are building a very nice business in terms of business services in that area. So there's more to the Amazon story than just pure retail. And that's the thing that we wanted to highlight in, the, in, our, in our particular note. Emerging markets, I think, is, is something which um, becomes quite, a, quite an interesting story for um, 2014. It's predicated on the fact that, uh, as you say, the, the sort of the tinkering that's going on, I use that word um, sort of generously, with uh, macro policy um, does have some implications for what happens to currency and the movement of funds flows around, around the world. Um, and um, its impacts positively and negatively to, um, to emerging markets. Um, emerging markets are undoubtedly uh, slowing 
um, they're still growing and emerging uh, markets tend to have quite strong balance sheets. The Asian crisis of 98 um, has meant that um, the balance sheets at the, at the um, sovereign level um, are in good shape, but there's undeniably been a slowdown in, in, uh, in emerging market growth and forecast for 2014. And it's really impacted on businesses that are exposed to that area. And the question mark is, would you buy into this dip um, on the belief that long term there is a there is a, 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 a bounce back to come or indeed whether it's discounted too far. We're picking on Unilever in the consumer goods space. I mean, nothing exceptional about a recommendation from, from Unilever. You would think, um, as a business, it's a consumer staple stock um, with over half its business um, focused on those emerging markets. It made that strategic play um, really to, to excel, extend their business into those areas and really becomes one of the major players in that um, market. The stock hit a high of just over £28 back in March of this year, and it's really been a derating process all the way through the course of this year, seeing that stock back down to the sort of 23.50, and we're buying that into the dip um, on the basis that we think that the derating has gone far enough and that we've got scope now to see a resumption of growth. I see a, a bank on the list this year, HSBC. Um, are we more positive on banks? No, as a general rule, we have to say that the banks are, are um, uh, continuing to face not just sort of headwinds, but possibly stronger headwinds against them. Um, it's been you know, a case that uh, we're seeing more and more fines across the sector, more and more criticism about business structures. And political intervention is, is an area that we're going to see more and more um, as, as they look to correct some of the imbalances within the economies at the moment. So the banking sector will remain, a, uh, I would think, an, a fairly easy hit to that. So while we're recommending well, HSBC, I think the first, first of all to say that um, I, I, most people are aware that it's uh, financially a much more sound operation than, um, than, than many that are exposed to the political whims of any particular, particular uh, sort of government. Um, and um, it's not to say that HSBC escapes it, it has incurred fines, but we see it as financially solid. It does play to our theme on emerging markets. Um, the, the, the share price of um, HSBC has derated recognising that sort of um, decline in the emerging markets uh, forecast. Um, but at this level, back down at around 640, dividend yield for HSBC is north of 5%, and we're forecasting a 10% growth in that dividend for the following year, 2015. So you're getting up towards a sort of 6% perspective for 2015 net dividend out of HSBC. So particularly for income seekers, um, it gets included for our 2014 list. Great. Um, do you feel there are any sectors in the market where the market's complacent? I think technology, um, we all get complacent with technology um, and technology uh, goes through pretty much um, uh, cycles of, um, uh, of growth and innovation and then consolidation. And Apple is a, is a, a company within that space that um, has been through the ups and downs through 2013. Um, and um, and the, the difference between the two has really been just a, a re relatively modest assessment of the sales of iPads and iPhones, um, whether they can continue that particular traction. But moreover, where does the innovation come from from here to drive the sort of next phase of, of, of development? So we're backing management to be able to deliver more than the market uh, is, is feeling at the moment. Um, uh, they're talking about televisions as a potentially a big area for them, but also personal wearable devices. Um, the market is going to sort of adapt its range of products that are internet uh, enabled and Apple I think will play a big share in that. It's a cheaply rated stock based upon its current earnings, it has a huge amount of cash and breaking into China at the moment. So we're, we would certainly be buying into that. The other structural theme that I, I play on at the moment is, is political intervention. Um, we, again, politics and business, um, the, the two have always got involved with each other, positively and negatively. There's no new story here. It's just really where is the impact coming from? Um, there's, uh, we've got so many imbalances within the economy that have been created out of um, the financial crisis. And really, in order to address that and to stabilise and really to, to uh, uh, try and avoid the worst case scenarios, we know that central banks have really just deployed huge amounts of uh, uh, their toolkit in order, to, um, in, in order to create that stability. Um, the net effect of that, of course, is that we are now starting to get some positives and negatives out of that, which politicians are undoubtedly going to have to get involved in. Um, and so if we start with the negative side, 
it's the cost of living. Um, Ed Miliband in the UK here has picked up on that um, smartly, um, as re really being the key issue at the moment. That sort of move down in interest rates in the UK um, largely absorbed cost of living increase, I think, for the first four or five years. But the net result is that we do have to have um, uh, sort of concerns over what impact that's having on, on, the, on, on consumers at the moment. Utilities are um, the one area that ever since that speech have come off quite sharply. We've seen a 20% decline in the price of Centrica, Scottish and Southern. And I think that over the course of the next 18 months, we're going to see um, that, that, that negativity of political Im implication really impacting hard on that sector. So I think we're being complacent in thinking that the sector is just going to sort of ride through this unscathed. But positively, the house builders, they're going to have to keep, keep the pressure on house building um, in a positive fashion. We're still building too few homes. We're still getting too many pressures in the system, which are increasing the cost of rent for people. And therefore, we need to get more product out there. And, and Barclay Homes is our recommendation of choice there. <clears throat> so with funding improving and investor confidence improving, um, what small caps will we will recommend it? Um, we've put Quindell on the list. Um, this is not a, a company that's uh, been without its sort of um, uh, market issues. As you can see here in May, they had a bit of a wobble. That was really sentiment around the stock. Um, but um, things have improved markedly in the second half of this year. And I will say in the last sort of two months, the company successfully raised £200 million of new capital to support its growth. The company is a service provider to the insurance industry. And as you can see, there are pains to be felt um, in the big cap insurance sector at the moment. Just note what happened with Royal Sun Alliance um, in terms of the cyclicality of their top line and the overheads that they have, um, which um, drives the bottom line. And if they can start to move more and more of the services away to a contracted third party like Quindell, um, who are picking up a range of new blue chips um, recently, they clearly have something there that is better um, and more price effective for the insurance companies to consider at the moment. So we're, we're buying Quindell um, on the basis that they're very cheaply rated um, and that re-rating of earnings could, could, could well result in a fairly material move up this year. And finally, um, on the small caps, treble8.com. It is a gambling stock, gambling stocks, bingo, casinos. This is not necessarily one for everybody, um, but uh, it's the opening up of the US market which is interesting us. Three states there that um, have now started to open up the concept of online gambling. This company is well positioned with all three of those and others that I suspect will start to roll through for 2014. Fantastic. Um, so to sum up, um, we're positive on equities over bonds. We'd allocate our portfolios across cyclical and structural stories, avoiding low growth businesses subject to government intervention. Geographically, while the core of portfolios are in developed markets, principally UK, US, uh, we would allocate to Japan specifically and increase our exposure to areas of China that are benefiting from structural reform. Um, finally, we, for those wanting to expand the risk budget within their portfolios, we would be increasing our allocation to, to small cap equities. Um, should you wish to play some of these themes through funds, uh, where would we guide clients to? Well, I, th I think the, um, one of our top choices would be the Global Dividend Fund. And I think this, really just to summarise where we think 2014, the normalisation of interest rates, the question about whether we, we're going to move back to a more normal style economy um, is going to be fairly critical about how assets are priced off of each other. We still take the view that the economies are underperforming sufficiently, that further stimulus is going to be required, both in America, here, and also in, in Europe um, uh, so far. We don't come out of this cleanly, and as a result of that, there's still going to be pressure on, on back on the bond market in terms of keeping yields low, whilst we try and sort of continue to engineer the recovery in a sustainable way. And the net result of that is that risk assets will continue to be attractively priced off of the back of that, and the Fidelity Global Dividend Fund is, is one such fund that we think buys the right stocks for this right market. Okay, so that's it from us. Uh, that's, those are our 2014 predictions. Any questions, please call your broker. Thanks. <laughs>